why study behavioral economics? And in particular, how can behavioral economics help us overcome some of the biggest problems that the world faces today? And just, just to remind you, behavioral economics is a field of study of economics that relaxes the assumption of rationality. So it's going to build people's irrationalities into our economic models. And even though we collect data in behavioral economics and do experiments, it is often with the purposes of improving our theoretical models. So why do we need a theoretical model in the first place? And just to remind you of this, theoretical models allow us to simulate the counterfactual compare policies and how they might play out in the future. So theoretical models allow us to make predictions. Theoretical models speak well with data, so they allow us to um, construct a worldview in the model and test it using data and contextualize different pieces of data in the context of that model. So theoretical models are super powerful, in which case we want theoretical models that accurately portray what's actually going on in the human heart. Now, I will add an asterisk there. You can have models that do not accurately portray what's going on, but still are good at prediction. And I might do another video on that. I just want to acknowledge that. But it's certainly reasonable to assume that if you build more accurate portrayals into your models, those models could get better. They could predict things more accurately. They could just do a better job of the things that models do. But I would like to talk about why behavioral economics is especially important in a world of big data and in a world where social media and different platforms online are beginning to manipulate human behavior in a meaningful way. This era is the era where we most need behavioral economics compared to the past and that's what I'm going to try to explain. So a number of people have begun to notice that social media is having a negative impact on people's mental health. Now, just because we're being manipulated does not mean that there's an evil manipulator behind the technologies. It's possible to have a technology that ends up manipulating people in a semi-evil way with no evil actors. So let me explain that. I'll call this evolutionary manipulation. I think that's a reasonable way of describing it. And it's basically just where someone gives the algorithm a goal. And maybe the goal is profit maximization, maybe the goal is maximizing time spent on the platform, but it could also be actually a good goal. Like it could be maximize the number of meaningful connections that people make on the platform. It could be any number of things. And the algorithm goes out and basically does guess and check over different techniques that might maximize this goal. And over time, as it observes behavior, it sort of learns and gets better at this. And if it's going for the one goal, then there could be all kinds of negative consequences, even if that one goal is a good thing, like human connection. And oftentimes the people who are setting up the algorithm to begin with, or the people who own the platform, have no idea what mechanism is underneath these algorithms. And the algorithms, of course, they're not conscious, so they don't know that either. So oftentimes the way these algorithms work are really black boxes. We don't know what parts of the human psyche are they tapping into to achieve their goal. And if we as humans cannot see inside the black box of the algorithm and what it's doing to achieve its goals, then we can't apply ethics. And this is where behavioral economics comes into play. Behavioral economics gives us a set of tools for setting up a framework for what might be going on underneath the guess and check process of the algorithm. So behavioral economics can provide a hypothesis. We can test that against what's going on with the algorithm or against other sets of data. So we need policymakers, and this is both policymakers in the government and also just policymakers inside these private companies that are developing these platforms. We need policymakers to regulate the algorithms. With behavioral economics, we can look at what's going on with an algorithm and say, oh, wait a second, this algorithm seems to be tapping into some instinct related to loss aversion, and the algorithm additionally has figured out that loss aversion or loss aversion coefficient is higher immediately after a disappointment 
So the algorithm seems to be pairing disappointment related news with threat related news or fear related news to sort of get that click out of us. And um, if we have a framework, a mathematical framework for measuring the loss aversion coefficient, we can measure when does it go up, when does it go down, and when is it scary? Going back and forth between our models of actually what's going on that might be exploited by these algorithms that have no idea they're doing that. And once we know that, once we have that framework, we can figure out what limits we need to put on these technologies, on these algorithms. We can say, okay, the algorithm is doing some great things. Social media brings a lot of good into the world, but it's also tapping into the vulnerabilities of people. And so we need to tell, tell these algorithms, you can't mix disappointment and threat. You can't mix those because it's too manipulative. That's just an example. And I like some of the things that Jaron Lanier has said about this. He's pointed out that the positive parts of the human experience, love, trust, relationship building, generosity, community, those things are slow. Those are slow building over time. They're not reactive and strong, whereas the negative parts of the human soul are reactive. So if your algorithms um, are rewarding immediate reactions, they're going to emphasize the negative. They're going to emphasize the experiences where we're in a state of threat, and that's likely to increase mental health problems. Now, if we think about that paradox and we think about retooling our algorithms so that they point us more toward the positive, we have some problems, actually. In fact, there's a reason why the immediate reaction is used so much in these platforms. It's because if you have these algorithms that need a closely tied match, time match that is, between cause and effect, to know that this, this cause and effect actually go together, these evolutionary models want to know if I do this, it will create this response in people and we're going to use that in our platform. Now, we could turn around the algorithms and say, okay, we, we want to build algorithms that actually build relationship, that build trust, that build love, that build these things that are that are positive experiences for humans. If those have a longer time span though, it's going to be harder to build the algorithms because the longer the time span, the more unsure the algorithm is about the cause and effect connection. If you have three days, a lot of things happen in those three days. How do you know if it's if it's what happened on the platform as opposed to everything else that happened? And so it's going to be harder for our algorithms to work if they're set toward enhancing the human experience by tapping into the positive parts of the human psyche. And what that means is we need more sound theoretical models to be working with the algorithms if we're going to set up a system that has better responses. So this is just a case for behavioral economics as one of the important features if we're going to retool social media and other platforms online so that they don't manipulate us in as negative a way, so that they actually manipulate us toward the positive.